So as I mentioned uh, before the Bible reading, we read from Mark chapter 4, so keep your place here. Flip over real quick to James chapter 4. We read the entirety of James 4 this morning, but I'm going to be drawing the title of my sermon from James chapter 4, a very popular phrase here, but we're going to read verses 6 through 8 in James chapter 4. The Bible says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. And the, the title of my sermon comes from verse number 7, where it says, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And this is a great truth to remember. And, you know, and we read in context verses 6 through 8 because this is talking about getting right with God, getting closer to God, He'll get closer to you, building a strong relationship with God as a child of God. That you want to resist the devil, you want to submit to God, you want to be humble before God, you want to do what God's telling you to do and keep getting closer and closer to God and he'll keep getting closer and closer to you and you'll be strengthened and just keep improving and growing as a child of God. But that phrase, resist the devil and he will flee from you, is a promise in scripture. And as a church that goes out and wins people to Christ and is trying to do a great work for the Lord and is, is ready to stand and be separated from the world and really do a great work, you can expect that there is going to be persecutions that the devil is going to attack, that there is going to be a reason to stop people from preaching the word. You see, people have this, this misconception in general about Satan, who he is and what he does. All too often you hear people thinking, you know, saying, you know, that Satan's down at the bar and convincing people to get drunk and all this other stuff. And you'll find Satan at the casino and you'll find Satan in all these wicked places. You know what? Satan's not hanging out at those places. You know why? Because those people have already been deceived and they're already doing nothing. They're already wasting their life. He doesn't need to keep attacking people and kicking them when they're down. They're already down. They're not fighting. There's no reason to go after people like that. But the reason why people think that way is they just want to blame everything on the devil right. instead of just facing their sins and getting right with God. Amen. Now, it doesn't mean that attacks aren't real from Satan. Of course they're real. But don't blame all of your sin. Oh, the devil made me do it. Right. Okay? We, can't, we, we cannot just, just not acknowledge... <laughs> our own responsibility for the actions that we take. Now, we're going to go through some examples. We're going to see how Satan does withstand people. And Satan does talk in people's ears, and Satan does get people to sin against God. That is a reality. But we still can't just blame him. I mean, you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. What happens? Satan tempts Eve and lies to her and gets her to sin against God. And then Eve gets Adam to sin against God. And what do people do? They start blaming everybody else. Oh, well, I mean, and it wasn't me. You know, Eve, the woman that you gave me, she's the one that, that caused me to eat. I mean, you, you gave her to me, God. I, I mean, she's the one that made me do this. And then she's just like, well, I mean, the serpent, he, you know, he was here in the garden. He told me to, to do that. You know, so you kind of pass the buck. But you know what? They all get punished for it. Yeah, that's right. they, they, they all have their own responsibility. So, um, Attacks from the devil are going to be real. We need one way we're going to have to resist the devil is understand who he's attacking, why he's attacking, what he does, and we're going to go through a lot of different things. But the, the main focus, what I don't want you to lose sight of, is you have to resist the devil, and if you do, he will flee. It's not something that is going to be just continuing and continuing and just not stopping. Because the devil has limited resources, the devil is not God. Satan is not omnipresent. He is not able to attack everybody at the same time. So the devil is going to strategically try to attack people and strategically try to attack people who are weak. All the more reason to remember resist the devil because if you're feeling weak, if you're weak in a certain area, you have to try to muster the strength 
to resist so that you don't fall to the temptation that maybe Satan's trying to attack you with, to get you out of the fight, to get you down and out so he can just keep moving on. Because there's only so much time he's going to spend on a person before he's going to say, okay, this is enough, I'm leaving and I'm going to do something else. Um, so Satan, he's not going to be hanging out at the bars or places where you think, you know, people just say, oh yeah, that's the devil's hangout. He's going after Christians that are trying to live for God. People who are trying to win souls. People who are actually making a difference and changing the eternity, the, the eternal destination in the lives of people. Um, we saw here in Mark chapter 4, just clear evidence of that in the parable of the sower. So look at verse number 14. The Bible says this, this is when Jesus is explaining the parable of the sower. He says, the sower soweth the word. So he's talking about some guy going out and sowing seeds. He's explaining, well, that's actually somebody preaching the gospel, preaching the word of God. They're actually sowing the word of, the word of God. Excuse me. And these are, they that, that, uh, these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, so people that hear the gospel, the sower's going out and preaching, they hear the word of God, they hear the gospel, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Why? Because he doesn't want them to get saved. He doesn't want people having the opportunity for that seed to flourish. So he's going to go and just try to make them forget, try to get them distracted from thinking about the gospel. These are the people who, you know, maybe I'll hear you again on this matter, or I need some time to think about it, right? When you go to the door, you sow the seed in their heart. They're not convinced. Maybe they don't fully understand. They just want to think about it. They're not ready to, to just decide to put all their faith in Christ at that moment. Well, you know what Satan's going to do right away? And it's a lot easier. I mean, that's a real easy target. Someone who's not even saved yet just to get them distracted, get them focused on some other thing, and to then not, you know, the word will then end up just going in one ear and out the other. Uh, but this is, this is something he does. Clearly, Scripture teaches that. This is one thing that, that the devil does. And... Um, I know it's probably a little bit out of order, but turn, turn to Acts chapter 19 real quick, because I want you to see this too. Just on my previous point, the purpose for the devil, he's not, he doesn't want to waste his time on people who are already fallen into bondage of sin, because they're not living for God. They're not doing anything. Acts chapter 19 demonstrates because it's not just Satan, it's Satan and his devils, right? There's other devils, there's other demons that go around and will do the same, you know, follow the same work as, the, as Satan does. And um, we see a story here of um, how these Jews were trying to perform exorcisms. They're trying to cast out devils. And look at verse number 13, Acts chapter 19, about says, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. So they're just like, they see the apostles like casting out devils. And they're just like, well, we don't know how he does it. They're, they're invoking the name of Jesus because they'll see the apostles, you know, casting out devils under the authority of Jesus Christ. So they're trying to mimic that, but they don't have the power because these guys aren't even saved. I mean, they're not going out and doing, you know, uh, casting them out. They don't have the power of the Holy Ghost. So they're just trying to repeat what they've seen. And what's really interesting, though, is how the devil responds to their command to get out. Verse number 14 says, And there were seven sons of one Siva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? They say, oh yeah, I know who Jesus is. Yep, I know exactly who Paul is, because he mentions both names. You know, by, by the authority of Jesus Christ, whom Paul preacheth, right? That same, pre you know, the same Jesus that Paul preaches. And they're like, well, we know who Jesus is. We know who Paul is. Who are ye? And then the man in the, whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. But what's interesting about that is the devil knew who's doing the work. You better believe that devil knew who Jesus was. That devil knew who the apostle Paul was because the apostle Paul is going out and getting people saved because that devil is trying to fight against the things of Jesus Christ and the things of the apostle Paul. So, the attacks are going to be, you know, the people who are doing the most work, 
people like the Apostle Paul, they're going to experience a lot more of the attacks because people like that are, are doing immense work for the Lord. So, yeah, you better believe the devil doesn't like that. It makes him angry. He's going to want to stop that at all costs. That's why you end up seeing, you know, churches, great churches, churches that do a lot for the Lord, eventually will inevitably succumb to some type of split, some type of fracture, some type of break because of the relentless attacks from Satan. It's it just a matter of time. Unfortunately, I mean, it's just a sad truth. It's the way it is. I mean, the churches that the apostles went to, I'm sure, were great churches, right? There was great churches in Jerusalem at one point. Where are they now? They've all come and gone. And the great churches of today, they're going to come. We're going to try. We're going to do our best to make sure, you know, this church or any other church that you, you're a part of can just stay on fire and, and keep doing things. It might take a generation or two, but eventually, you know, the, the more you're continuing to do work, the attacks are going to come until Satan finds a way to split it up, break it up, and stop the work that's being done. But if we can maintain a resistance to the devil, he will flee from us. Um, if you're saved today, obviously the devil can no longer keep you from going to heaven when you die. That's one of his objectives. We saw that in Mark chapter 4. He's trying to take away the word stone in people's heart. So he can't do that anymore. Praise the Lord for that. But what he can do is try to keep you from getting other people saved. Right. And that's another way to attack. One way is going in, stealing the word from people's heart that hear it. And then the other way is get you to not even go and do that so he doesn't have to steal the word from their heart. Um, because you're going to be sowing, you know, if you could stop the sower, you don't have to worry about picking up all the seeds that he's sowing, right? There's many ways that the devil is going to try to do this. He's going to want to destroy your testimony so that people don't believe you, which means he's going to try to tempt you and get you into sin. He's going to keep you from going to church where you're going to be sent out to preach the gospel and getting and getting built up and trained up and, and edified and spiritually strengthened to be able to do the work. He's going to, so he's going to do what he can to try to keep you from coming to church. He's going to do what he can to keep you from going soul winning. Right. And um, to keep you from a church where, you know, we've got a pastor preaching and, um, but we still need to remember that the Bible tells us if we resist, he's going to flee from us. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. The Bible teaches us that we are not, to, we are, we are not ignorant of his devices. The Apostle Paul wasn't ignorant of the devices that Satan uses to try to get the work of God to cease, to try to get people out of uh, doing the work of the Lord. And we see one such example here in 2 Corinthians 2. And like I said, we're going to look at, at multiple examples of how Satan attacks people. Because we don't want to be ignorant of how he's going to attack, so we can be ready for it. If you know the types of attacks that Satan's going to come at you with, then you can be strengthened and ready and prepared to defend yourself against those attacks. Then you can be ready to resist so that he can leave you alone. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse number 5. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many, so that contrarywise you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you, that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it for your sake, sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his devices." So what he's explaining to Corinthians, there's somebody who had committed a sin. There's someone who had done wrong here. And what he's explaining is that this guy suffered a punishment that was inflicted of many, and he suffered enough, and it's time to forgive him, and don't allow him to just be engulfed and just overcome with sorrows to the point where he's just given up. 
I mean, you need to be able, we need to be ready to forgive people when, you know, when they repent, when it's appropriate. And he's saying here, you know, don't allow this person to just be consumed with, be swallowed up, it says in verse 7, swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. He's a brother in Christ. You're going to need to comfort him. And he explains, you know, hey, I forgave this guy and to, who, to whom I forgive and you know, to, whom, to whom ye forgive in verse 10, I forgive also. So if you guys are ready to forgive this guy, I'm ready to forgive him too. Whatever you bind here, I'll bind too, right? And, and God gives us, as a church, you know, he gives a church, whatsoever is bound on earth shall be bound also in heaven. And whatsoever is loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. We, we've got certain authority of, of just forgiving people and, and moving on. And, um, and he says, for if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Not forgetting Christ who forgives us of our sins, right? Never lose sight of that. We preach hard on a lot of sin, and there's some things that we don't tolerate and are not acceptable, and we try to keep biblical standards on things. But let's not get overboard and it, to the point of, of either being hypercritical on people where it's not appropriate, or not allowing for the forgiveness that needs to happen so that people don't just get swallowed up in overmuch sorrow and then why because that's one of satan's devices he wants people to just be completely washed up and and not able to get back in the fight right. there are some people that you know they've repented they've they've gone through they've suffered and hey man it's time for them to get back in the battle it's time for them to get strengthened back up again they've you know if Christ is able to forgive them, then why can't you? Yeah, and this is, this is that type of a, of a teaching here. And this is one of the things that the devil wants to use. He wants people to become bitter against brothers and sisters in Christ that might have done them wrong. Right? So if someone does you wrong, the devil wants you bitter against that person and unable to forgive them. That's what the devil wants. But the Apostle Paul is reminding these people, hey, remember the attitude that Christ had. Because we've all done wrong against God, against Christ. We've, we've done wrong to him, yet he was still able to offer forgiveness to us. And um, we ought to have a similar attitude with that. So um, that's another one of the devices that the devil uses. Uh, let's flip over to... kind of went over that already. Flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So I brought this up briefly. I'll go a little bit more into detail. You know, the devil wants to try to destroy you by getting you into sin. So one of the ways he's going to do that is making sin look attractive, right? And we see there's, there's many obvious ways and many not so obvious ways. Uh, I, think, I think a real obvious example is like Las Vegas, Right? You can look at Las Vegas from afar and what do you have? All these statues and monuments and buildings and structures that are magnificent structures, right? You could go and marvel at the engineering that goes into it and all the lights and flashing and sounds and, you know, all the things that draw people. Wow, this is so cool. This is amazing. You know, you walk into a place and it's like a big palace, right? They have Caesar's Palace, the King's Palace. You walk in and it's designed with all their pillars and, and all of this money poured into these places. And you can go in and, and have servants wait on you and be treated like royalty and come down to our buffet and whatever, right? And, and it's all a show. It's putting a jewel in a pig's snout when, and, and even worse than a pig, when you think about the wickedness and filth and the sin that goes on in Las Vegas. Yeah, that's right. They, they try to make it look appealing and fun and roller coasters, all this stuff. But anyone who's walked down the streets knows how full of filth the city is. You can't even, if you're trying to look down, 
The last, it's been, I don't even know how long since I've been there last. The last time I went there, I vowed never to go there again. I don't ever want to go to Las Vegas ever again. Because, I, you know, last time I was there, I was already saved and I was going there for like a wedding or something, right? Not for fun, not or anything else. It was a close family friend and I was going to a wedding and we're down there and it's like, you can't look up anywhere because they have digital billboards everywhere. And they're promoting filth and you know strip clubs and whatever and you walk by on the street and you can see these places and there's you know women up ha partially dressed and, and dancing you know it's just this stuff is in your face everywhere you go so if you try to just look down and be like well I'm just gonna look down so I don't have to be exposed to this stuff the whole ground is littered with all these these advertisements for all the strip clubs and escort services and all the other filth that goes on there you cannot get away from it at that place. It's horrible. It's wicked. But they draw people there. They draw you with all this stuff. Oh, we'll give you a free night stay and we'll give you this and we'll give you that so you can come in and, and waste all of your money through covetousness. Come in and, and, and sit down and we'll treat you like you're great so we can just take all of your money. And we'll, throw, we'll, we'll flash up some people. Oh, look at, all, look at this person won a million dollars. This person won $100,000. And they have the picture of someone holding a lot of cash. And throw that money in front of your eyes to get you coveting and wanting that quick buck and, and sitting down and basically, you know, end up losing all your money. But I went once and I won. Okay. You go back again, you're going to lose. Just look at the, you know, the buildings that they build to draw you there. That wasn't built just from their own money. <laughs> they keep building this stuff up. It's your money. It's everyone else's money that goes into these places that go and people literally lose their life savings and retirement and, and because they get addicted to this covetous practice of gambling. But Satan likes to dress it up and make it look like it's fun. Make it look like it's not that big of a deal. Oh, hey, everyone's going to go and have some fun. Oh, you get a free hotel. You're... Don't be deceived by the illusion. Uh, lots of things are like that. You think about the commercials. and You, know, you see people just drinking booze and, and living together and fornication and adultery. And none of it ever really seems to be that big of a deal. And just desensitizes you to the sin and the real consequences, you know, the Bible says for the wages of sin is death. Sin is never dressed up to look like death. It's always dressed up to make you look like it's something you should do. I mean, you think about even just the, the Hollywood actors and actresses. What do you see in People magazine? Well, I don't see anything. I don't know. Whatever, whatever they put on the cover, right? I don't read People magazine, but whatever these stupid magazines are that are all about the lives of these movie stars and actors and actresses and they're going to have TV shows about the houses they live in and how wonderful they have it and they have so much money and they're going out to these parties and they have whatever their heart can desire and it's so cool and it's so much fun. But wait a minute, what about their drug addictions? What about their multiple marriages? What about their just descent into depravity right. and filthiness? and sorrow and how much they put on a show to make it look like they're really happy but inside they're miserable people and oftentimes end up killing themselves either killing themselves on purpose or killing themselves through booze drugs whatever and destroying their lives because they're not happy because it's not all it's cracked up to be don't be deceived by that but see satan wants you to make make you think that this is, all, this is all fun and games. I mean, the, 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 the beer ads and stuff, it's people playing sports and having a good time. Like, you don't need beer for that stuff. You, have, you can play the sports without any of that stuff, and you're going to have a better time. Right. <laughs> you, get, you start drinking and doing these sports, you're just going to get injured. You're going to get hurt. You have wounds without cause. You're going to wake up and be like, how did that happen? Yeah, that's good. And that's what the Bible teaches. Right. And it, I mean, who wants to wake up with, with 
cuts and, and whatever, just all kinds of stuff. You have no idea how it happened. That's where alcohol and drugs are going to get you. Don't be deceived by Satan's lies. Uh, not only is he going to try to dress up sin and, and make that look appealing to you, he also gets involved in religion and truth and tries to counterfeit the truth to deceive people and, and get them spinning their wheels in the wrong direction in their pursuit of God, in their pursuit of trying to do what's right. So maybe it's not working very well of trying to get people into sin. So he's got multiple approaches. Say, okay, well, well if one's not working, well, now I'm going to hit them from the other side. This person doesn't want to do the drugs. Maybe they've already been there and done that. They know that it's going to destroy them. I can't fool them with the gambling and the drugs and the fornication and the adultery. Well, let's give them now a false option for religion. Because they want to get right. They want to do things right with God. Let's give them a false God. And still prevent them from getting saved and still prevent them from actually doing Good work. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, look at verse number 13. For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. The false prophets, Satan is transformed into an angel of light. Light's a good thing, right? We see it in the Bible, walk as children of light. You are of the light, you're not of darkness. Well, you know how, how Satan's going to come to you as? As an angel of light. As, hey, I'm a good guy. And this is what the Luciferians actually believe. They've been deceived into this thing by thinking that Satan really is just misunderstood. He's actually a good guy. This is a Luciferian religion like the Mormon religion that basically teaches, you know, Lucifer, Jesus, they're brothers. Yeah. They had two different ideas. Lucifer is just a little bit misunderstood. You know, God the Father chose not to take that route to save the world, but He's still, Lucifer's still a god, and he's, you know, whatever. It's, it's not quite as bad. And, um, and just straight up Luciferian people who look at, at Satan as not being, I think they even have TV shows about that. Don't, wasn't there a, I mean, I don't know. There was, wasn't there a program out TV that's like this focused on like Satan kind of as a person? And Lucifer, right? That's, just, that's just, yeah, I saw, I saw something about it. And I read some article on it, and what I was reading just made me think, like, yeah, it would make sense that they're, they're showing this, and they're probably trying to pit him in a good, or you know, in a not-so-bad light, like he's just this misunderstood, or he does things where it's, you know, I, and again, I mean, I may be a little bit off on that, because I haven't seen any of the episodes, but that was what I, the little bit I gathered from what I'd read about it. It's not a big surprise. There are plenty of people out there that, that are deceived by Satan thinking, you know, because he's approaching as an angel of light. Hey, what's so bad about getting knowledge of good and evil? Well, nothing except that God forbid Adam and Eve from, <laughs> from having that. That one little detail. But then what does Satan do? Yea, hath God said? Did he really say it? Wait, did he really say that? I mean, this is, a good, this is a good tree. Look at that fruit. I mean, it looks pretty good to eat to me. Why would he put it there if, uh, and it's all ready to eat if, if he didn't want you to have it? I mean, he just knows that you're going to be like him. You're going to be a god if you eat this. That's the way Satan works. Satan's attack, he attacks God's word. That's why we have so many different Bible versions out there. As I just mentioned, his MO, one of, one of his devices is make you doubt the word of God, make you question, is that really what God said? Lie about what God actually said and just get people confused. That's a, a big way of getting people not to get saved. Hey, well, how am I supposed to even know what to believe? I mean, there's over 400 versions of the Bible in English. How do I know which one to pick? 
And they don't even say the same things. What in the world? What am I supposed to believe? How do I know this? Right. It's confusion. Mm -hmm. And Satan is the author of confusion. All the different false doctrines. Well, this guy says I have to be baptized to be saved. This guy says I've got to give up my sins to be saved. This guy says I've got to be part of his church to be saved. How do I know? And all of those things, you've got people dressed up nice, they're appearing as ministers of light. They're not carrying pitchforks and horns. They're trying to look good and look the part. And the false prophets are the same way. They don't really care about you. They care about your money. They care about themselves. They care about glory for men. They care about everything else but you. But they're doing the bidding of Satan himself. Satan has many ways to, um, to try to deceive people, but we need to resist the devil. Turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. We're going to look a little bit more in depth here. of when Satan was withstanding David and provoking David to sin. And this is, again, a legitimate example of Satan actually going on the offense and attacking someone who was doing work for the Lord. Say, uh, you know, um, David was all for serving the Lord. And Satan's trying to trip him up here and to make him stumble and fall because he was doing too much good. First Chronicles 21, we're going to look at verse number one. The Bible says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. So one of the ways here that Satan is using to get David to sin is by bringing up an opposition against him. So God had told them that they're not supposed to number everybody, that they don't need to worry about numbering people because God is their defense. You don't need to count up all of your soldiers when you're going to face a battle because you're relying in the Lord. It doesn't matter how many men you have, so don't do it. That was an instruction given by God. So when David went and numbered the people, he was disobedient to the Lord. And see, what Satan was trying to do, he's trying to provoke David to do that very thing. That was his goal. Right. He didn't think that he could win in a battle fighting against God. Because if he's going to bring another nation to attack or invade Israel, when God is with them, He's going to lose. And he knows that. But if he can get to the man and get the man to sin, then he can get a victory that way. And by bringing this force, by standing up against Israel, and the way, you know, there's the, the, um, the rulers of the, of the, you know, the, the wow, sorry, it's been a long day. The, the rulers of the darkness of this world, the spiritual wickedness in high places, there are devils in high places that are influencing the leaders of this world. I firmly believe that. I think that's very easily proven from Scripture. And Satan is using whoever, it doesn't even matter who, to stand up against Israel and to provoke David, to get him scared into disobeying the commandment of the Lord. And going and numbering Israel. So he does that. Verse number um, 2 says, And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go, number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me, that I may know it. And Joab answers. So Joab's trying to step in here and say, Well, hold on a second. You know, you sure you want to do this? Because of what God said. It says, verse 3, And Joab answered, The Lord make his people an hundred times so many more as they be. But my Lord the king... Are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then doth my Lord require this thing? 
Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? So here we have Joab even trying to remind him, you know, I don't think we should be doing this because of what God said. Which is really interesting because you know the life of Joab, like this is like one rare point where we see him on the right side of things and not like killing somebody for, you know, for his own purposes, his own gain. But he's trying to remind David here, like, let's not do this thing. Verse number four, nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab, wherefore Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Uh, and Joab gave the sum of the number of the people unto David, and all they of Israel were a thousand thousand and a hundred thousand men that drew the sword, and Judah was four hundred threescore and ten thousand men that drew sword. But Levi and Benjamin counted he not among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. So Joab still doesn't even complete the job. He's just like, I can't number everybody because of what the Lord said. He's like, we can't do this. So he gives them this number, but still leaves some people out. I think just trying to... to make sure that he doesn't bring too much, you know, trespass and sin upon Israel. And it says, but that still wasn't good enough because David's heart was, was still, he made the wrong choice. Verse number seven, and God was displeased with this thing, therefore he smote Israel. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing, but now I beseech thee, do away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And um, it says, And the Lord spake unto Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Choose thee either three years famine or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while that the sword of thine enemies overtaketh thee. Or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coasts of Israel. Now therefore advise thyself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for very great are his mercies, but let me not fall into the hand of men. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. When you sin, especially when Satan is attacking you and trying to get you to fall and commit sin, you need to realize that it's never just you that's affected by your sin. Like the guy I was soloing with today, he's saying like, oh, it doesn't impact anyone else. Well, yeah, it actually does. You may not realize or can see all the ramifications, but when you sin, there's always some other consequence, some unintended consequence that you hadn't thought of. David's just thinking, well, I just need to make sure I'm making the right choice and I want to know what the number of the people is so I can be a, make a wise decision in my battle or whatever, you know. I just need to know that he's the one doing this. I'm sure he's not thinking ahead of, well, what's actually going to happen? How is God going to be chastening us by me doing this, by me sinning against the Lord? Well, this is pretty pretty severe. I mean, 70,000 men died as a result of David's sin. Because, and this, so this is the way that Satan likes to attack. Because when he get you to sin against God, that's a victory for him. What David needed to do was resist. When Satan stands up against Israel, David should have hearkened unto Joab and said, you know what, you're right. I don't need to know the number. We're going to trust in God and not worry about it and say, we'll go to battle. The Lord is with us. He's already delivered us out of the hand of the enemy so many times. We don't need to know the numbers. Let's just go and fight and withstand the devil. You know what the devil would have done? He would have fled from him. He would have left. He because. He tried, he failed, he's going to move on and go and try for somebody else, find someone else. <coughs> the Bible teaches us in 1 Peter 5, 8, turn if you would to Luke chapter 4. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Satan is real. Satan is out to attack. We're seeing this as evidence. This is why we need to be vigilant. The more people this church reach, it reaches, the more we will be attacked. And the devil is going to look for the easiest targets. As a roaring lion, he's your adversary, he's the enemy. When you're trying to do good, he's going to try to withstand. 
And just like a roaring lion is walking around looking for that meal, seeking we may devour, that's what the devil's doing. And just like in nature, I mean, animals aren't going to pick. If they, if they could find the unstable, the wounded, whatever they could get, that's going to be an easier victim for them, an easier target, an easier meal. That's what they're going to go after. That's what criminals of today do. We were talking about this with the security class and stuff. This is, this is a common thing. Uh, when I was going through a lot of different self-defense classes and stuff, you know, they've done studies talking to people who habitually commit crimes of like robbery and rape and things like that. And they talk to them and, and have gotten them to open up about their mindset when they go and commit these crimes and what they're doing. They're looking for marks. They're looking for people that they could target that is going to give them the least resistance. That's why so often you hear about women and elderly people getting purses snatched from them, getting their money taken from them, because they're going after who they perceive to be the weakest target that they can do. Because why? Because they don't want to get hurt. They don't want to have the kind. They want to just get their money. They just want to take from somebody without having any negative consequences come on themselves. Well, that mindset is very easy to understand. Satan's going to be trying to do the same thing and trying to get in either to destroy a church or to destroy a person. He's going to try to find people who are weak, people who are going the right direction, people who are going to be making a difference, but are going to be easier to attack and to get out of the fight. Why? Because it, he doesn't have to spend as much time on them. He's trying to get in, get out, be done, devour, move on to the next meal. Be vigilant. We're going to see one more example here. We're almost done. Luke chapter 4 is where Jesus is tempted by Satan. So we're going to see just one more example. Satan has a lot of devices, and we didn't, we didn't go through all of them tonight. He's, got a, he's been around for a long time. We have a short period on this earth. Satan's not bound by the same years that we have. He's had time to learn and understand human beings and their weaknesses and their faults and their you know, areas where to get to people. And we have a lot of areas. We have a lot of shortcomings. We have a lot of weakness in flesh. So if he can't get you in one area, he's going to try another. But let's look at to see the way that he tempted Jesus Christ. Because... I think, if, you know, he knows going up against Jesus is not going to be an easy task for him. And the way that he goes against Jesus Christ, he's, you're going to see him try to bring up Scripture. You're going to see other things. Let's, let's look at this. Let's read this story here in Luke chapter 4, verse number 1. The Bible says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So this is a high point at the beginning, you know, near the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he just got baptized. He's in the Spirit. He's full of the Holy Ghost. He's being led by the Spirit into the wilderness, right? Everything's going great. Just got baptized, starting his ministry. Holy Ghost upon him. Verse number two, being 40 days tempted of the devil. So now he's gone into the wilderness and Satan is just going after him. 40 days. It's a long time. And Jesus is fasting during this time, this 40 days. He's going in to fast. So in, in the flesh, he's being weakened, right? His body physically is, is, is kind of in a weakened state because he's fasting. But spiritually, he's strong. I mean, of course, very strong. Jesus Christ is very strong spiritually. But, um, uh, you know, there's, there's an there's an opportunity for Satan because there's some form of weakness with Jesus Christ being in a physical body. Uh, let's keep reading. It says, And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. So he went in the wilderness and was there for 40 days. He was tempted to Satan, and he didn't eat anything. Verse number three, And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. So he's, he's hitting them with two things here, right? One of them is his obvious hunger. He went 40 days without eating. You better believe Jesus Christ was hungry. So he's trying to entice <coughs> Jesus Christ to go ahead and eat something now. Break that fast. 
And also he says, well, if you be the son of God, like basically prove it. Tempting God and just saying, well, yeah, well, why don't you just prove it to me? Just like the people that, why don't you come down from the cross then? If you be the Christ, why don't you come down from the cross? Then we'll believe you. Satan's going, well, yeah, if you, if you are Christ, then why don't you just turn this, this rock into bread? Verse 4, And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So he answers him and just says, you know, I don't need to eat. I've got bread from heaven. Verse 5, And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. And I believe that this is another tactic that the devil uses on people even today. Trying to entice people with the allure of riches and power and glory, but you just have to worship me. He said, I, this is all under my authority and under my realm. And the Bible says that, 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 that Satan is the god of this world. And he does have power in this world. I mean, it's limited, but he still has power in this world. And he's saying, hey, I'll give all this to you. Verse 7, if thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. I'll give all of this stuff unto you. Trying to entice him with this covetousness, with this power, with all these things that, that might allure flesh. But look at verse 8. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So trying to get Jesus to sin by worshiping Satan, and Jesus didn't fall for it. It doesn't matter what you offer me, because the word of God says that I'm only going to worship God. I'm not going to fall down and worship you. I'm not going to serve you. Verse number 9, And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. So now he's trying to use God's word against him, saying, oh, well, if you're the son of God, I mean, this is what the scripture says, so why don't you just go ahead and cast yourself down here because God's going to protect you and make sure that you're, you're not even going to hurt your foot. You're not going to not going to have any problems. And Jesus answering said unto him, it is said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. This is what the stupid atheists, the, what some of the more recent comments, uh, you know, after I've been on the, the news and stuff, you always get the trolls and the atheists wanting to think they're so clever and so smart. Oh, well, if you believe all the Bible, well, what about Mark 16 where it says, and if you're going to drink any, you know, basically anything poisonous, that you're going to be okay, you'll be fine. So why don't you go ahead? Why don't you just go and drink some poison? This is exactly what Satan is saying to Jesus. Well, why don't you just throw yourself off a cliff? I'm not going to go and tempt the Lord God. It doesn't make this untrue just because Jesus chose not to be a fool. And the statements in Mark 16, they came true. We already saw that. We saw the serpent bite uh, the Apostle Paul and he felt no harm. But we don't see him picking up snakes and dancing around trying to get him to bite him. It was a promise of God from, of protection, but it doesn't mean you tempt God and just go and do these stupid things. The people, they, they, just, they don't get it. I don't even respond to people like that. It's just kind of funny because I, I remember reading a comment and I'm just like, that, that's Satan talking right there. That is Satan speaking because that is what Satan said to Jesus Christ. It's the same exact argument. Look at verse number 13 though. So, so Jesus responds. Now, every single response, verse number four, verse number eight, verse number 12, Jesus responds with the word of God. He's tempted of Satan through various means, through his, you know, weakness in his flesh, trying to use God's word against him, trying to get him to believe something stupid or do something stupid, you know, based on Satan's interpretation of the Bible. And every single time, Jesus just says, no, it is written. No, it is written. No, it is written. And he's solid. And he resists 
Look at verse number 13. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Jesus resists the devil. What happened? He fled. He left. But also notice this. He fled from him for a season. We need to be ready to resist. And if you resist, and then the persecution stops, praise God, rejoice, but don't forget that he'll come back. You don't have to worry about continual attack just, just day in, day out, and it just doesn't ever stop. There is an end, but you know what? You'll get a break. You'll get a respite. And it doesn't say in this gospel, another one, the Bible says, and angels ministered unto Jesus. So he made it through the temptation. He made it through everything. And then he's ministered unto. And if you can stay strong and resist, make it through, you'll get ministered unto as well. So we're going to close with this. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to close on this passage because... We need to take a look at ourselves and make sure that we're ready to resist the devil, not to break down, not to give up, not to be confused or distracted or led away by some lust of the flesh, but willing to stand strong and being ready to resist Satan and his attacks. We've seen many different ways of how he operates, of how you know, he's going to try to get people into false doctrine. He's going to use false prophets. He's going to try to get you into sin. He's going to try to destroy your testimony. He's going to try to keep people bitter against you if you do something wrong so that you don't forgive someone. And, and you know, there, there's a lot of different ways that he's going to try to attack. And what we find in Ephesians chapter 6 here is the armor of God. We need to be ready to have a defense against Satan and his attacks. And the Bible talks about having the proper armor. Look at verse number 10 of Ephesians chapter 6. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So in order to resist the devil and his attacks and his wiles. If you think of wily coyote, right? He's, he's always trying to come up with tricks and lay traps for the roadrunner. Because he's wily. That's what the word wild means. So it's the wiles of the devil. The devil's trying to lay traps. He's trying to lay tricks for you. He's trying to get you to stumble and to fall and to run into a brick wall and to fall for, you know, anything to destroy you. So in order to be strong against the wiles of the devil. We need to put on the whole armor of God, not partial. We don't need just a helmet and leave the rest of our body open. We don't need to, to put on the breastplate and, and leave your head exposed. We need to have the whole armor of God. Let's read what it says here. Verse number 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's the verse I was trying to quote earlier. So we read it right now. And um, notice, too, that it's talking about in verse 11, the wiles of the devil. And saying in verse 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principality of powers. The rulers of the darkness of this world are under the influence of the devil. He's putting these two together for a reason. The spiritual wickedness in high places, we need the armor of God to withstand against the wiles of the devil. We need the armor of God because we're in a spiritual battle. Uh, verse number 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand. Resist. Don't buckle. Don't break down. Verse 14, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. So we need to know the truth. We need to be in God's Word, studying the Word of God, knowing right from wrong. Amen. Knowing when Satan's going to come at you with some lie, no, I've got the truth. Yea, hath God said? Yea, God did say that. Right. And then you won't be deceived by him. Having on the breastplate of righteousness, doing right, not giving in to the lust of your flesh, you can have that breastplate standing firm saying, you know what, I'm living right. I'm doing right. You can't bring my testimony down because I'm not just off committing fornication and adultery and, and drunkenness and all this other stuff. I've got a breastplate of righteousness on. 
Verse number 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's part of your armor. Going out and doing the works. Going out and preaching the gospel is part of your armor. You say, but isn't that going to put me in, in danger? Of the no, you're adding armor. That's one way you're putting on the armor of God is by going out and do that. Whether you understand that or not, it doesn't matter. This is what the Bible says. Your feet need to be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And I think this is where David's problem was. He didn't have the shield up. The shield of faith. Faith, trusting that God won't let you down. You don't need to number the people when you're trusting that God is with you. It's a lapse in faith. Oh, I left the shield. I've got my breastplate. I've got, you know, got the helmet on. My feet are shod. But man, you need that shield up in order to quench the fiery darts of the wicked, to stop them from getting through. 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We need all these aspects in order to stay strong, in order to resist. Stay strong in spirit. Stay strong in the word of the Lord. Stay strong in the work that you're doing for God. Have the faith. Know that the Bible says if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. I don't care how hard things are getting. Don't give up. Don't back down. Don't be like the people that when the pressure is turned high or when, when the sun comes up and it's scorched, that they wither away and you don't do anything for Christ. When the persecution comes, just stay. Even if you can't fight forward and keep pushing ahead and keep doing more, just stand. Resist. You don't have to advance all the time. Let's advance when we can. But when Satan's attacking, at least stand. Just stand and resist. Amen. Don't back down. Don't get out. You can move forward again. You can wait till he flees. Just stand steady and resist. And then keep going forward. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for... Um, the warnings that we have and the instruction that you give us, Lord, help us all to be fully armored and to understand, since we are in a spiritual battle, help us to understand the adversary and not to be um, deceived or surprised when attacks come, but that we could be ready, that we could expect them to come and, and not let it sway us and not let it bother us, but that we can keep moving forward and getting a lot of work done. Lord, um, strengthen our church, our church family, our, our just everything that we're doing here and guide us and lead us and help us to do more for you. And it's in Jesus name we pray. Amen.